All right, we are in chapter 10, part 10 of Brace for Impact, Prepare Your Soul. Uh, it's, it's entitled Empowered in Contentment. And the idea there, we're going to see four quadrants where no matter what situation you are in life, God has moved you into that situation to train you, to teach you, to help conform you into His image so that you may do the things He's called you to do. Uh, I'm going to begin in Philippians, Philippians chapter 4. Uh, and, and read a little bit of the context of this verse. We don't just jump right into it. There's, in a sense, three levels of this verse that I'd like to point out. Philippians chapter 4 uh, is, first of all, Paul is addressing the Philippians. It's a positive letter to the Philippians. Uh, he's encouraged them to kind of work out their differences and work with each other. But in chapter 4, beginning in verse 10, He's talking about a, a fi they've supported him, a, a financial gift. Paul is in prison when he's writing this letter. Uh, in prison, his first time in the book of Acts, around 60 to 62 A.D., he's in prison for two years in Rome, actually under house arrest. There's a guard wait watching him, and he's going to appear before Nero for a trial. The Jews should be coming from Jerusalem. The, 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 uh, the crime took place in Jerusalem, and he appealed to Caesar, and they put him on a prison ship and shipped him to Nero, and it doesn't appear the Jews ever followed up with any charges, and Paul is going to be released after this imprisonment in 62 AD. So he's under house arrest. He's made a couple appearances before Nero. He's pretty confident he's going to be released. This is not the 67 imprisonment when he writes 2 Timothy, where he says he's being poured out like a drink offering. The time for his departure is near, and he's sure he's going to die. But in, he's writing uh, back to them because they brought him a gift, uh, some kind of gift. It would be financial. They'd sent a pe couple, couple people to, to help him and to you know, take care of his needs, report on what's being taken place. People are coming and going, visiting Paul. And he's going to, one, he's going to thank them for the gift. So that's the context of this verse. He's thanking them for the gift. But he then stops and wants to make sure they understand it's not because, he, it's not because of need. It is, he's not saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. I needed this. If you hadn't come through, I don't know what I would have done. He's saying, it's not because I have a need. Uh, because then he goes on and says a, a, a very famous verse, familiar verse, because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so we'll just write, through Christ here through christ who strengthens him it's like uh thanks for the gift but i'm not thanking you because if it wasn't for you my whole ministry would have crashed because i've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation and because i've learned that i can do everything through christ who gives me strength now we'll talk a little bit about all things through christ who gives me strength that is not a humanistic statement even in the chapter saying that in the sense of, you can do anything, and you set your mind to it, Christ will come alongside and empower you. That's total humanism. If a church is preaching that, they've missed the whole point of the gospel. They've missed the whole point of a relationship with Jesus Christ. They've missed the whole point of a personal ministry empowered by the Spirit of God. They just put it into humanism. You're using just typically of the Western church, using Jesus like a genie to get what you want out of life. You can't do anything through Christ who strengthens you if it's whatever you want to do. Like, well, just name a list of the top ten things you can't do no matter what Christ does for you unless Christ has called you to that and is empowering you to do it, in which case you're going to get it done. You don't need the Philippians sending you money to do it because you're called, in Paul's case, to be an apostle of the Gentile, and you're going to get it done. I, I've learned if I've got plenty or if I've got a need that I can be an apostle of the Gentiles, I've learned the secret of doing anything or all things through Christ who strengthens me. Meaning, in context, what Christ has called him to do, Christ will empower him to do, and it doesn't depend on his situations or his circumstances. So anyway, thank you for the gift, and the reason he's thanking, not because he has a need, because I can do anything through Christ who gives me strength, is because you're going to receive some kind of a reward, so that your gift, Christ is using it, but you'll also receive something that will be credited to your account. He says, it's nice for you to participate in this because I'm excited about what's coming back your way because God is going to continue to supply for you as you continue to help take care of the ministry. So he recognizes it's a gift. 
He recognizes it came from God. He recognizes that they're going to be rewarded for it. But he makes very clear, and that's our context here, that uh, his ministry is not based on their money, and it's not based on his determination. It's deter- based on Christ conforming him into uh, the image of Christ and empowering him to do these things. And again, they are overlapping. There's going to be the Philippians giving and providing for Paul. Paul's going to have to get up and go do things. So on, the, on one level, it looks like it's all the Philippians are financing it. Paul's working really hard. So all these people are working together. But he pulls the veil back and says, no, God is going to reward you for what you're doing for him. And God is going to empower me to do whatever he's called me to do in spite of your gift. Well, here it is in the NIV. In the book there, I, I use the English Standard Version, but I'm reading from the NIV tonight. Chapter 4, verse 10. And we've, you know, we've gone through four chapters or halfway through the fourth chapter. Paul writes to the Philippians, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. Now, he'd been in prison in Caesarea for three years, and now he's made it to Rome. Now he's in prison for two years. And so there was like somewhere between maybe a three or four year period of time where they couldn't make contact with him. They couldn't send something to him or they hadn't been, you know, made the effort or some reason. He said that they were concerned, but they couldn't make contact or they didn't. And now he says, I'm glad we were back together. But you had no opportunity to show it. Verse 11, I am not saying this because I am in need. He's not saying, you know, I I don't, it's not because I'm in need that I'm saying this. For I have learned, and that's an important word, that's a a word that means uh, I've been initiated. I've gone through the process. It's a word, it's a technical word used for someone who joins a group like a fraternity and they've been initiated through knowledge and experience. I've learned, meaning you've got some knowledge, okay, you've been trained in it, now let's go off and live it, and it's like an apprenticeship would be an example. Here's your, you've been trained as an educated, you've been gone to classes as an electrician, you've worked with an electrician during the days, and now after a period of initiation, you're ready to take the test, and you you pass the test, and now you are a a licensed electrician. It's going to take some classwork, it's going to take some on-the-job training, it's going to take you going through and and practicing and now you've been initiated if it's in plumbing if it's electrician or if it's in some fraternity like the wise men or the magi from the east Uh, for i have learned that's what that word means i have been initiated i've gone i've got the knowledge and i've gone through the training the on the job training to be content i have learned the secret to being content whatever the circumstances so what he has learned what he's been initiated into is this thing called or this phase called this attitude of contentment i have been trained i have the knowledge i've got on the job training boots on the ground experience that i'm content well what's he content i'm content whatever the circumstances meaning the point is, and we're going to get into four quadrants. I'm going to come back, and, and I may take a detour here. Uh, and you're going to see four words right here, and I'm going to break them down for you. Uh, they're going to be words that are going to be, and I've, I've shared this with you before. They're going to be passive, verbs that are in the passive, verbs that are in the active. One is going to be uh, plenty, and one is going to be want. Another over here, active, is going to be plenty, it's, not the, it's a different word, and want, or lacking. Passively, he's going to have plenty, meaning he didn't do anything, but it just came to him. Uh, want, lacking, in the passive, he didn't do anything, he just ended up in a situation, not his responsibility, not his doing, he was just in a situation where he needed stuff. Or active, where he has had plenty because he actively did something. He actively had a job. He actively invested. He actively went out and created the situation. Or in want, lacking, because he himself actively did something to cause this situation. Maybe even including, again, it doesn't say it in the context, the very fact that he's in prison in Rome may be Paul's actively 
doing something to put himself in a position of want. The Spirit, on his way to Jerusalem, the Spirit tells him at least three times, if not more, don't go. Do not go. He's supposed to be an apostle. Very clearly, the Lord has told him, the Spirit has told him, the work of his ministry, and Paul even knows it and says it. I'm an apostle to the Gentiles. Peter's an apostle to the Jews. But all whole time he's going to the Gentiles, Paul's looking over his shoulder back at Jerusalem thinking, but if I could just go back one more time and explain to them, I know I could make a difference. God says, no, don't go. Go here. And he makes a trip, collects a large amount of money, and he's going to take it down to the saints in Jerusalem, and he does, with the intention of, I'm going to just slip in here and talk to the Jews on the temple, clear some things up, and I'm sure if I just have a chance, if I have a chance to explain it to them, I know these people. And he gets there, and he doesn't any more than get on the temple mound, then he gets arrested, a riot breaks out, and he's pulled out into the, the, the practorium there on, on Fort Antonia, and he never, it's, he's in prison for five years. He never even gets a chance to explain it. And again, it, the Bible, Luke does not write, and Paul should not have gone, but his whole time on his way going down there, there the, the, including Agabus, just outside the city, tells him, he takes Paul's, the prophet Agabus comes with Paul, takes his belt, ties his own hands up with it, and says, the owner of this belt will go to Jerusalem and be bound. Do you still want to go? And Paul says, I'm ready to die for Christ. Well, that's the point, Paul. God is not ready for you to die yet, would you not? And, and, and it, uh, there's been other, there's other situations that we could, we could, and we've tracked through it. Anyway, that's off the subject, but that would be an example, potentially an example of Paul actively doing something to put himself in a place of want. But when he steps back and looks at it, he says, all of that was God giving me knowledge and giving me on-the-job experience, so I've been initiated. If I'm in any of these quadrants, I've learned the secret. I've been initiated into contentment. And when I have found contentment, no matter where I'm at, if I've got plenty or if I'm in prison in Rome, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In other words, I am an apostle, and if I'm an apostle traveling from city to city, or I'm an apostle locked up under house arrest in Rome because of some stupid thing I did, if it was stupid, something I did, now I'm in prison in Rome, I'm still an apostle, and God is still going to empower me if I find contentment and trust Him that He has me here and is going to work with me in this situation. And those are the words that we'll see here in just a minute. But what I want to do on the, on the notes right here on the page, there is a Psalm 107. I want to go over there and read that because Psalm 107 talks about the goodness of God, and then it's going to take you through it. I'm going to read through it, and you'll, you'll see it. You'll see it when I read it. Those same things of situations of people talking about the writer, of, the writer of Psalm 107, God is good. This psalm is about the goodness of God. And he's going to give you one, two, three, four groups of people who found themselves in four different situations for four different reasons. But in every one of those situations, God shows up and reveals his goodness in that situation and on the notes on the notes uh or in your thank you good thing i had a dark shirt on i just wrote all over my shirt with a black marker almost wore white tonight that'd be ridiculous um i'm on page 83 of the notes or page 83 of the book um uh, reading in the, let's say, the, the top paragraph halfway through. It says, however, when we study the verses that proclaim God is good, we see that part of God's good activity towards us does not fall within our, quote, pleasant and pleasing definition. If we were to write good, what is good? We would list all these things. But God's list of goodness involves some things that we would say, ah, I don't think that's good. Almost like a coach, though. If you go to basketball practice and you want to have a good coach, you just want him to do these good things for you, uh, he may end up doing some things with you that you do not consider good unless you've been trained and have some experiences like, oh, yeah, this is a good coach. He's making us, you know, run hard. He's making us run through the drills. He's making us execute the play and, remember, you, you know, he's making it difficult. But the goal is not just to be having a good time eating pizza and, and drinking, you know, Coca-Cola or something at practice. We just love this coach. It's like, yeah, do you ever win any games? No, but we have a great time. Well, 
we have a coach that maybe is using life not just for us to have a good time, but for us to accomplish his mission. Thus, I say this. Um, we see that part of God's good activity towards us does not fall within our pleasant and pleasing definition. Things like testing, trying, examining, and sacrificing are also part of the goodness of God. For God to do good in our life and get us to the place of victory, it's going to require those things. I write in Psalm 107, there's 43 verses. Actually, we're just going to read the first 32 uh, there are real life situations where some of the people were these things. Some of the people that we're going to see, there's four groups, were lost and wandering. Some were subject to bitter labor. Some were caught in a storm in a ship sent by God. And some were suffering divine discipline for their rebellion towards God. But every one of the four are all going to at the end say, this is the goodness of God. God is going to deal with us and meet us where we're at and get us back on track. Uh, some had rebelled, some had obeyed, some were guilty, some were innocent. So we go right here. These had rebelled, these had obeyed, these were guilty, these were innocent, and each of them, God met them where they're at. So uh, here we go. I'm going to read Psalm 107, and you just kind of follow through with this. It's the same idea. These people found themselves, in, in a sense, what Paul is talking about, in the process of initiation. And here we go. Psalm 107, uh, verse 1. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Now, again, that's on everybody's bumper sticker, their refrigerator, on their church bulletins. The Lord is good. Oh, yes. And then we just break off from there, and we start talking about what, how good God is. Well, well, well let, let's read what He does as a good God. Let the redeemed of the Lord say this. Those He redeemed from the hand of the foe those he gathered from the lands, from the east, the west, the north, and the south. And here we go. Verse 4. The first of the four groups. Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them from their distress. So they were in a situation, wandering in the wilderness, didn't know where to go. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men, for he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. So there's your first group. Now, don't you can try if you want to. Like, is that the Exodus generation? Is that the people going to Babylon? Is that what, what group is that? I, I don't even know if we know what that group is. There's just this, I, they know this group. They were wandering in the wilderness. They didn't have enough food. And they found themselves in a situation where they're going to perish. So they cried out to God. And he delivered them by leading them in a straight way into the city. And they considered that a wonderful deed. So these people were lost and wandering. And God showed up and helped them. Next group. Verse 10. Some sat in darkness and in the deepest gloom. What, that, what does that mean? depression no prisoners suffering in iron chains these people found themselves in prison they were not a community of people traveling in the wilderness trying to get to this next city and they couldn't make it they were actually now been arrested locked up in prison for some reason they were sitting in gloom and darkness locked up in iron chains why were they here well it tells you for they had rebelled against the words of god it, these were not people that were suffering persecution because they were believers. These are people who had heard the word of God. Maybe it was how to live in a society the right way. And they decided to rebel against the word of God, what God had established as right and wrong. And they found themselves locked up in prison because it says they rebelled against the word of God. So it, it would appear they were human prisoners because they had disobeyed something that God had established as His Word, probably some social standard that was right. Uh, for they had rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. So He subjected them to bitter labor. They stumbled and there was no one to help. So now they're in a place where they're in prison, they're being taken out and used as slave labor because that's what they are, they're prisoners that have rebelled against society. Wow, verse 13, then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. 
He brought them out of darkness and the deepest gloom and broke away their chains. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wondrous deeds for men. For he breaks down gates of bronze and cuts through the bars of iron. Verse 17, your third group. Some became fools through their rebellious ways. Instead of being wise and following God's words, or instead of being a simpleton that just didn't know, and they heard God's word and they changed their simple ways, the fools, we'll talk about this later in this book, uh, the fools, they know, they know what God w- wants, but they don't have the self-discipline to execute it. They're fools, they, they know what's right, but they go ahead and rebel anyhow because they don't have any self-discipline. A fool needs self-discipline. For example, a simpleton, we've talked about this before, a simpleton does dumb things because they're simple. They don't know. You teach a simpleton. Come here, let me explain to you what you should do. Oh, no one ever told me. Now the simpleton is on his way to becoming wise. The fool, they already know. You don't need to teach the fool. They can teach you. They could, they could, they could teach the class. What they don't have is self-discipline. So you've got to come along, or God's got to come alongside the fool and provide some kind of structure of discipline. Now that's exactly, that's teaching class. When you teach a class, you're you're presenting knowledge and information, like in school, they're teaching the children this knowledge, and they're simple. Now they learn, now they can execute. Well done, children, you're on your way to being wise. Yet some children, they know, but they don't have any self-discipline. They don't have no motivation to do it, and so... You need to not provide them with knowledge. You've got to provide them with a structured environment. I will be your control. I will be your discipline. I will make you do it. And now you'll be successful. That's, and, and it is a twisted society now that whenever people do that, many times it's like, what are you doing? You're being mean. Uh, I'm doing what they should be doing for themselves. I'm providing them discipline. They should be providing it for themselves. Now, they're children, so they can't. So as a teacher, your job is to come alongside and provide them with that motivation, that discipline, that structure to get them where they want to go in the first place. Sometimes it's knowledge. Sometimes it's this. Well, here they are, these guys. Some be, verse 17, the third group, some became fools through their rebellious ways. They, it's not that they didn't know. It's they knew. They just weren't going to do it. And suffered affliction because of their iniquities. Again, going back to the classroom situation, if you don't provide that structure for the kids, that discipline for the children, they're going to get into a situation eventually in life that's going to afflict them and bring about many problems. And I have seen it happen. In fact, sometimes you just cut them loose, especially parents who who like, you're picking on my child. Okay, hey, I'll stop picking on your child, and I'm going to just live long enough to just watch this crash and burn. And you won't even remember me, but I'll be watching. And all of a sudden, I can tell you examples of people that have crashed and burned. Parents go, I don't know what went wrong. I can tell you. It was this age, this age, this age. And we're all, you're all mad at the teachers. So we just, fine, just let them go. I'll just stand here and watch. And I can give you examples. I can tell you, I can tell you examples of people in prison that I knew. It's like, I, and they, don't, stop picking my child. <laughs> okay, you're going to have to deal with him when he's 18. And they did, and now he's in prison. Or more and more. And again, anyway, that's this situation here. Some became fools through their rebellious ways and suffered affliction because of their iniquities. They loathed all food and drew near the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent forth his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. Let them sacrifice thank offerings and tell of the works with songs of joy. And the fourth group, others went out to sea, out on the sea, in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. Nothing wrong with this. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep. For he spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. So they're out simply, they're just about going about business. They're not rebellious against the word. They're not fools. They haven't, the the second and third group both rebelled against the word or they were fools. uh, And they were in a situation that was their own fault. God delivered them. Now, these people are out, they're doing business. It's not bad to do business. They're out doing business. 
uh, merchants, and all of a sudden they saw the works of God in the deep, probably the Mediterranean Sea if we put it in context, and all of a sudden the storm blows in, and you're out there, you can see, oh, this is like Genesis 1 all over again, just chaos, tohu, to, wahu, uh, uh, tohu, wab, I'm forgetting the Hebrew, okay, never mind, but uh, chaos, <laughs> tohu, wabohu is what I want to say, I'm not sure if that's even right. Uh, I should it's just sometimes I, I, I talk faster than I'm thinking. Okay. I still want to figure it out. I can open my Bible and check. But nonetheless, anyway, they're out there in the Mediterranean Sea and a storm blows in. And they're seeing the works of God and the storm blows in. And that's what it says. They, they rise up. Uh, his wonderful deeds for he spoke and stirred up the tempest. He lifted the, that lifted the waters, that lifted the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, they, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunken men. They were at their wits' end. I mean, they're basically going crazy out here in this storm. They know they're going to perish. And what do they do? Now, again, they've done nothing wrong. They've done nothing wrong. They're just on a, on a journey, on a merchant's, you know, traveling to sell their uh, merchandise, and God sends a storm. He meets them where they're at. They cry out to him for, for help. Uh, in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. Let them exalt him in the assembly of his people and praise him in the council of the elders. Then it goes on and talks more in that chapter uh, some other ideas there the point being that verse that chapter that psalm 107 going back to philippians right now is about the goodness of god and the goodness of god if you're in a state of rebellion and gave you two examples or you simply are traveling and you get caught in the desert and can't find your way or you're traveling in the sea just do, being a merchant you know, in one case, in two cases, they were rebelling against the word of God. In the other case, two other, two cases, they're do going about normal life, behavior, following God, and they all face trouble. But they could all call out to God, and he would deliver them. And they were, in a sense, learned that God will meet them where they're at, and they had a form of their own initiation. Going back to Philippians, our text verse tonight, uh, I'm reading it uh, again here. I'm reading, well, page 82. I guess I used the NIV for this. Uh, page 82 of your notes. I have learned, the, learned to be content, Paul writes, whatever the circumstances. And that is, we're talking the chapters, empowered in contentment, learning to be content in any and every situation. And then he goes on and says, for I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. So here's the word need, and the word plenty is what is being said right here. And I'm going to check my little chart, see if I get this right, make sure I don't. Plenty, okay, I can't, can't tell. Uh, uh, what it is to have need, in need, and what it is to have plenty, and I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. There we go. Let's do that right there. If you look, we should just go ahead and look at this so I can clean this up for us. Uh, go to page 84, or the second page of your notes. And there we begin breaking down uh, Philippians 4, verses 12 through 13. Uh, the phrase, I've got it there, I already said, learn the secret in parentheses there, that first paragraph, is a technical term in the Greek that refers to the process of initiation that would include more than merely attaining knowledge. It would also involve a sequence of life experiences. And like Psalm 107, these people were in a life experience and they learned something. Paul, when he's, re he's writing this in somewhere, probably, uh, I'd say more like 61, 62 A.D., because he's anticipating getting out, uh, so he would be, you know, probably 60-some years old. He's going to be executed in 67, 68. So he's got a lot of, he's already had the experience with uh, uh, the Corinthian church, church, the Ephesians church. He's gone through the Galatian situation, gone to the Jerusalem council. 
Uh, he's already taken the money down to Jerusalem, so he's got a lot of life experience in the ministry. So it's easy to say at this point for him to say, I've learned the secret. It may not be possible, again, I don't know, this is speculation, for him to write this when he's writing the book of Galatians to say, I've learned the secret. Uh, because he may not have yet learned. He was an apostle, he was called, just like he was called to be an apostle on the road to Damascus, but he probably had not learned the secret to being content in any and every situation because he's got to have some life experiences. So again, this would be something that you're going to have to live to, to kind of develop. The various situations of life are then listed by Paul in a form of, of quadrant. Paul says he has learned to be content. Here it is. Well-fed or hungry. Um, hungry. How would you spell hungry? In plenty and in want. And you can see that right there. Then it says... These four may seem redundant in the translated into our English Bible, right? I mean, whether well-fed or plenty, or well-fed or hungry, having plenty or in want. It's like they're redundant. Sometimes in the Hebrew, there's parallelisms, where you write, they say the same thing twice, just saying it again. This is not a parallel uh, ex example. The first prosperity, the phrase well-fed, is passive. In the Greek, you could look it up in the Greek, it's passive. Uh, and this would mean Paul was uh, the recipient and not the doer of this, uh, of this verb. He was well fed just because uh, the house he was born in, uh, the places that he stayed. He's, just, you know, he's got a good education. He's, he's well fed. Uh, this is also true of the, for the poverty of the last in want. Okay, I've got to switch these. The last in want is also... passive so he begins well-fed passive and in want meaning he's lacking passive meaning i didn't do it i just ended up in a situation where i was in want um the other two phrases hungry and plenty are verbs that are in the active tense which means the subject of the sentence does causes this to happen so paul cause this to happen he made himself have plenty he did something to make himself hungry here paul just received it somebody else did this these four quadrants and then i've got a little chart over there on page 85 the four quadrants of life the point being and again you can understand this we would all like to be right here is where i would like to spend my life right here this is the american way active plenty I am, the I am the creator of my own destiny. I will determine my own fate. I am a free man. And I'm going to make wise decisions. I'm going to follow the law. I'm going to follow the, the written word of God. I'm going to follow reality. And it will provide me with plenty. So right here, this is where I want to be. An American actively producing my own prosperity and well-being. Okay, and that's, that's noble. That's the target. That's what the book of Proverbs is about. This is where you want my, I want my sons to live here. Take control of your own destiny. Make wise choices, and it will go well with you. It's, it's even promised to be that way. But reality is you're going to end up in these other quadrants also. You're going to end up there. The most bitter place to be, as you know, is right here because you did it you made a dumb choice you made a mistake you did this thing yourself and now this is going to take some kind of uh you know self-forgiveness this is going to take some kind of you know well you're going to have to you know some people just start blaming others just start blaming these other people but no you did this you're going to, have to face the fact it's no one's fault you did this. And you're going to blame everybody. You're never going to learn the secret of being content because you're too busy making, you're too bitter to learn this. Or you beat yourself up and you never forgive yourself and I'll never try again because you're right here. You're going to have to realize at some point you're going to find yourself lacking even though you're a free American making your own choices, being wise, got a good education, living, following God. At some point you're going to do something that's like, I hadn't done that and I've been there 
And I know all the, I mean, when I talk about not being bitter, I, I could, I, it was not my fault. It's like, yeah, yeah. As soon as you get done blaming everybody else, let's look at the situation again. And, you know, maybe five years, 10 years, 30 years. It's like, yeah, it probably, yeah, it was, it, it was my fault. Okay, you're going to, you're going to end up there. This is, this is a guarantee. Passive. You're going to sometimes be well-fed, have prosperity, have plenty, be in a good situation uh, because of, you know, I was born in America. Uh, God is going to cr- cause something. I, I, I had a, a good family. I had these benefits. I was just well-fed passively. I didn't earn it, didn't deserve it. It just was given to me. Someone else caused this. Um, that's also nice. It'd be nice to spend your whole, whole time in these two quadrants. But you're also going to end up in want sometimes because someone mistreated you. It's not your fault. Life just, some, you don't can't, it was a God, was it saint, was it people, was it what I ate? What, what, what happened? You're in want. You don't, it, and you're going to have to deal with that. You can say God isn't fair. Uh, life isn't fair. Why would I even try again? Or you can just say, I'm in want. Now, if you have been trained, if you have been initiated, if you've learned the secret of being content, knowing that God is good. He, when you are here, God is good. And the thing is, I, I guarantee you, God is going to allow all four of these things to come into your life. You're going to have plenty because congratulations, good choice. You're going to be hungry and be in need because, yeah, you're a fool. It's like you're going to be in want. You're going to not have because someone didn't treat you fair. Someone mistreated you, lied about you at work. You lost your job or whatever. Or well-fed, you're going to have something because, you know, your your dad left an inheritance and you just got a bunch of money. And it's like well-fed. You're going to be in all those situations. And God's goodness is going to be there in every case. But no matter what case you are, no matter which one of these quadrants are in, if you are called to be an apostle like Paul, you're called to be an apostle. The only way Paul could be an apostle was if he was right here. No, Paul is an apostle. And he's going to end up in all four of these quadrants at some point. He is an apostle here if he's actively causing his prosperity. He's an apostle here if he's done something stupid, like go to Jerusalem to try to save the Jews, and the Spirit says no, 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 and he ends up in prison for five years. He's still an apostle. And if I like those guys on the ship or those on the, in Psalm 107 or the guys in prison under bitter labor or those who were, were sick or those who were in the wilderness, if they'll cry out to God, you know, examine yourself, say, okay, here I am, not a problem. You're back in the saddle. You're still living here. He's not going to always put you right back here. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I was wrong, I'm wrong. Okay, you can go back to prosperity. No, 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 you're here. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, good. Then you're an apostle. You're a hungry apostle. Well, I want to be, I don't want to be hungry. Now, you're hungry. You made a dumb choice, but guess what? You can be content because you're going to achieve God's will as a hungry apostle. It's like, okay. And what's your goal? To have plenty and not have to suffer? Or is your goal to be an apostle? In Paul's case, he says, I've learned the secret to be content in all these things. And then he says that famous line, he says right here, reading in the NIV, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And then he says this verse, keep it in context, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. It's like, it doesn't matter if I've got money or if I'm hungry, whatever it is. He says, I can do whatever because he gives me strength. Because in Christ, I'm an apostle. And he's telling, again, in context, he's writing back to the Philippians. Thank you for remembering me. I know you've been concerned about me, but we just didn't have a chance to exchange phone numbers or text messages. And now you've sent someone with some money, maybe some food, some kind of gifts. And he says, I appreciate it. But understand. I didn't need that because I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whatever Christ has called me to do, I can do it in any one of these quadrants. And uh, if it's my fault and I've made a stupid choice, 
I can still be an apostle. If I'm being mistreated and it's unfair, it's not just. I can still be an apostle. If it's just passive, I don't know, I just got a string of good luck, if you want to say that as a Christian. Uh, uh, I can be an apostle. Or if I've got a job and I'm taking care of myself, I can be an apostle. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And then he goes on and talks about what he's really interested in is the fact that they gave to the Lord's ministry and that God is going to be able to add rewards to them. And so this is really a huge concept here um, to understand, wrap your mind around, because one, the idea of doing everything, that anything that Christ has called you to do, you're going to be able to do it. And a lot of times, I mean, I know I, I'm human. I live in a real world. I need to have everything perfect. I need to have finances. I need to have a good night's sleep. I need to have peace in my life. I don't want any conflict. Everything is fine. And I am a Bible teacher. And then all of a sudden, I make a stupid choice. And now I don't have a job. Uh, I'm uh, having all kinds of trouble. I got one. I had my van repossessed because I came and tried to follow the God and went into a followed, went to a Christian ministry and couldn't make the van payments. They repossessed it. It's like, what are you now? Well, you're a Bible teacher without a van. It's like, okay. And you got to start delivering newspapers and working at AARP in the evenings, answering phones while you work a full time job trying to be a Bible teacher. Uh, so you got basically three jobs, and you're still hungry because that's not enough money to live in West Des Moines. It's like, what, what, what? Well, you made a choice, but guess what? <laughs> you're still a Bible teacher. Or I didn't get treated fair. I, I, got, I, I, I lost my job. I got fired. I, it, someone tried to burn me, whatever. It's like, or whatever. It's like, well, so now I can't be a Bible teacher. Well, yeah, if you're not initiated, if you don't know these things, then you just got to quit and pout, blame, get bitter, get mad. Or you can just say, well, that wasn't fair, and keep teaching the Bible. And you can do it. God will give you strength in this quadrant. Now, this quadrant, it's easy to see the strength. I got money, I've got food, I've got peace. Down here, I don't know if I even trust myself. I've made a bad decision. Yeah, but you're still a Bible teacher. Now, oh, people are against me. Oh, I don't know, it's not fair. It's like, I'm in one. I didn't do anything, I didn't deserve this. Oh, you're still a Bible teacher, do it. Or if it passively, you have stuff, it's like, I, I'm not sure why all these things are working out. It's just things are working out. It's like, and Paul definitely had those. I, I, when you talk about passive, some of the friends he met and traveled with, they were wealthy people. They would have churches in these people's homes, which meant they were more than little, you know, dirt floor huts. I mean, they were like two stories. One time, he's preaching in someone's house so late in the night, and don't let that scare you, that uh, uh, someone fell asleep in the window and fell to their death. So, I mean, they're on the second floor or third floor of this building, crowded with people. People are sitting in the window, dozes off and falls out the window. Paul goes, prays for them, raises them back to the dead. The point being, they were in some very nice houses. Guys like, uh, people like Aquila and Priscilla. They had a house in Ephesus and in Corinth. They had their own business, both in Ephesus and Corinth. Paul worked for them as a tent maker, which would mean he was a leather worker. He was trained. His skill, his craft was leather working, which was very useful in making tents. So he would, was a leather worker, and he was working with Aquila and Priscilla. They, they took care of him, but they themselves, they were up here actively prosperous, but then they could passively support Paul, and he could have church in their house if it's in Ephesus or if it's Corinth. And that's just a couple of examples. Uh, some of the people he met were, were uh, public officials in Ephesus. I'm thinking Ephesus and Corinth. Uh, Erastus. Uh, they, they even found his name in a stone. He, he was in charge of public works at the end of the book of, is it, is it Romans? Because he's writing from Corinth to Rome. Erastus, who's one of the public workers, and they found in Corinth, they found a stone that Erastus, in that same position as a public official in charge of public works, paid for a road with his own money. And they got the, the stone with his name in it that he paid for the road. It's probably the same guy. So this guy's a public official in charge of public works and wants a road right here. It's like, yeah, I'll pay for this. Let's get this done. And that's why, that's why he got the position. He didn't get voted in. It's kind of like, you know, I'll just finance this and I'll just take charge of this. So there were some people that were, could possibly make Paul very passively well-to-do. But there are definitely some people that caused him some problems. Like the second imprisonment, 
he, he had uh, the metal worker came against him. And you can see other places he go, gets stoned to death. It wasn't his fault. He's doing God's ministry. You'd think that if you're doing God's work, no one would throw stones at you because God would protect you. But he didn't. He got stoned, then they left for dead. It's like Paul's ministry's over. Not so, because he gets back up and walks back into the city. He's, it's definitely not fair. He's all bruised up, walks back into the city because what? He's an apostle in one. It's not his fault. It just happened to him, but he's an apostle. So with that, that's why he can say, by, by the time he's 60-some years old, in, in writing to the Philippians, if that's how old he is, it's 61, 62 A.D., he says, I have learned, I've been initiated, I've got knowledge and on-the-ground, on-the-job training that I've learned how to be content in any and every situation. If it's my fault, if it's someone else's fault, if I caused it, if someone else caused it, I can do all things, and that's the key right there, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I just, I'll, I'll say that again. I, I've got, I'll read it on, on the book there. It's, it's very important because when people, churches are just wanting to, you know, make a message or you hear people, and again, I don't want to take away from what God is doing in their life, but there's that verse just hanging there, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's like, what do you mean? Are you talking as a, a, a Bible-believing Christian who's been trained in the knowledge of God and have learned to trust God in any every situation to do what God's called you to do? Or are you talking like a secular humanist, that man can do anything, and you're just using a Bible verse to justify your humanism? And we're on the bottom of page 85, Right here, it says, in contrast, it, it's this last paragraph, in contrast, this verse does not contain any humanistic meaning such as, whatever I set my mind to do, I can do. The power of Christ will not help you achieve anything your human will desires. Now, when I say that, what I'm saying, the, Christ will not help you accomplish just anything you choose. I want to do, and you name this thing you want to do, Christ is not your personal genie. The idea, best example, I've used it you know, several times, just a couple weeks ago I used it. Joshua outside of Jericho. They're, they've crossed the Jordan River. They're ready to attack Jericho. Joshua goes out and kind of scouting the city out, and all of a sudden he sees uh, an angel with a drawn sword, and he draws his sword, and he says, are you for us or for the enemy? Well, it's the angel of the Lord. It's the manifestation of the second member of the Trinity. It's the Son of God. It's the Word that's going to eventually become flesh. It's going to be Jesus. But it's the angel of the Lord. And that Joshua says, are you for us or for the enemy? And the answer, obviously, is Jesus is for Israel. He's for Joshua. But Joshua, are you for us or for the enemy? And the angel of the Lord says, neither. I mean, are you for Israel or are you for Jericho? <laughs> no, no, I'm not for either one. But as commander of the Lord's host, I've come to you. I have a plan for you. Now, you're going to work for me. And that's exactly the way it works for us. It's like when you come to Jesus, it's like, okay, Jesus, this is what I need you to do for me. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. No, I created you. I called you. I saved you. I placed you here. I gifted you, empowered you with the Spirit, and gave you a gift. Now, you ask me, Lord, what do you want me to do? Because now, whatever I ask you to do, you'll be able to do it in any of those quadrants and nothing will be able to stop you. Oh, well, I'm not ready for that kind of Christianity. I, I, I'm, I want the Christianity where I have goals and I have dreams and I need God to bless my plans. Okay, Joshua draws the sword. Are you for us or for the enemy? The answer is the same. Neither. I'm not here to help you have your best life now, God would say. I am here for you to find out what I've called you to and then you to be initiated through these four quadrants so no matter where you find yourself in life, you can still identify yourself as I am an apostle, I am a Bible teacher, I am a what has God called you to do. And now you can, stay, now you can focus and get that done. Uh, it goes on here, I write, it does not mean whatever I set my mind to do, I can do. The power of Christ will not help you achieve just anything your human will desires. The verse does not say the power of Christ is available for you to use however you want. If God has not planned, or watch this, now this is important. If God has not planned or purposed your intention, your human effort will not accomplish it. Or watch this next line, or worse. 
And even if you do achieve that goal, you will not find contentment in it, and the things you did to accomplish it may well destroy you. Let's say you have a gift. Uh, a gift, or we'll say talent. I'm not separating spiritual gift from natural talent. And God has called you, gift. He's created you with a talent. He's engifted you as a believer. Both are true. You have a gift, uh, natural talent. You also have a spiritual gift. God has given this to you, and the, His intention is for you to advance the kingdom of God going this way. But you see this, this dream down here, and you know, I, I mean, think of some talent, some gift. I, I don't, I, I want, I keep going to guitar playing, okay, like a guitar player, some, someone that's just gifted musically. And I don't, want, I don't want to use it because I don't think everyone should be playing in the church choir, okay? If you're a good guitar player, you better be playing in church. It's like, well, yeah, I don't know that, you know? Uh, but whatever, let's, that's an example of someone that's got just some crazy gift uh, that God has powered them with, and they, they don't follow God. They have, ah, I have this. It's like all of a sudden having a huge inheritance. And you know this. You win the lottery. Great. What are you going to do with the money? Are you going to invest? Are you going to plan ahead? No, I'm just going to buy all the things I've always wanted, and boom. You, you burned it all up, your life is destroyed because you won the lottery. The worst thing that ever happened to some people is they win the lottery. Now, that could be a good thing if you used it good. The same thing, you have won the lottery. You've been born, you've got talents, you're a believer, and God has given you a spiritual gift. So, in a sense, you've won the lottery. Now, what are you going to do? I'm going to use my gift and talent for what I've always wanted to do and go this way. Well, first of all, it may not get you there. This dream may fail. And you'll eventually have to turn around and come back and use it where God intended. And you hope. The worst is this could succeed and you could become out of your wildest dreams all that you wanted to be in the human world with this gift and this talent. And now that is the very thing that destroys you because you're using it alone without the guidance of God and you know, whatever that gift and talent would be. And that is the negative thing. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I have this gift and this talent. I'm going to go this way, my own desires. You'll probably fail because you won't have the endurance to do it. But if for some reason you push on and you do succeed, it may destroy you. Because this, was, this, this idea that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me is not that you get to choose where you're going to go with it. It's that you find out where God has taken you. Like Joshua. Joshua said, who are you for us or for the enemy? And the Lord says, for neither. Well, here's what Joshua said. Here's what I want you to do. And then we're going to go over here and we're going to attack and start naming cities. And they couldn't even defeat Ai after Jericho. You know the story. Because they got into the head. Someone stole the gold bar and the Babylonian garment. Achan did. So if he, did, he just couldn't take the, the Ark of the Covenant and start marching around destroying places as he wanted, he had to follow. In fact, Moses says, the angel will lead you, and you're, you're going to have to follow this angel. The Ark, in a sense, was following the Lord, uh, and the Lord chose Jericho, and Jericho fell. So you understand, there's that point. If Joshua had just gone off with the Ark of the Covenant, the calling he had, and marched where he wanted to, he might have ended up like some of those kings of israel just their lives just crashing and burning and uh, having disaster leading the people in disaster and it's even worse if you're a leader because it's not just you you're leading in a disaster you're leading your your family the people that you're in charge of it be your business uh your nation you know leading them down this path of of chaos anyway that's that story right there and at the end of page 85 uh, keep your life free from the love of money, the book of Hebrews says, and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So in those four quadrants, don't let money always be the decision because God will never leave you or forsake you. And if he's called you to do something, no matter what quadrant you're in, he's there with you, just like he was in Psalm 107 with all those people in those different situations. Call him, he's going to lead you to a place of success in his standard of his criteria uh, then at the bottom i was planning on maybe taking some time and reading through page 86 and 87 uh, some more promises of god's way to fortify your soul and that's what we're doing it's just i got some things written there uh, 
and you can refer, re read those, reflect on those. But the idea here is that very idea of us fortifying our soul, having these things in our mind, in our soul, so when the days of trouble, when you find yourself, and the, and the thing is, uh, we will, you're going to be in all four of those quadrants. I have been in all four of those quadrants. I would like to think I never will be in the quadrant of need or want. I'd like to think I'll never be, have someone come against me again. And I'd like to think that I will never make a stupid, stupid mistake again. Uh, but based on the Word of God, God is going to lead you through all four of those quadrants so that you will fully be initiated and you'll keep your skills sharp. Uh, gosh, I don't like to preach that because I sure don't want God leading me into the quadrant of want just to keep my skills sharp. It's like, really? But it's like a basketball coach. It's like, do we really have to run line drills? Well, we're going to be running a press this next week. We've got to stay in shape. Can we win the game without running the press? Can we win the game with just shooting free throws? It's like, eh, that's not how the game's played. You're going to have to get up down the floor, son. Uh, and I'm afraid that's, you know, I don't know. You just keep thinking about being old, how much older, how much longer do I have to live, and how many more times do I have to go through the four quadrants to be initiated and, and keep my skills sharp. Can I just be like, okay, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Come on home. It's like, uh, not yet, you know. Get up out of the pit where they threw rocks at you. Walk back in the city and keep going. Paul could just lay in the, well, I did the best I could and just died, you know. But he got up, walked back in, and kept going. So not, not celebrating death by any means, but you do think about, well, you look back at your life and look at all the struggles you've gone through and you made these and got this far. It's like, okay, now I'm not going to do those things again. Nope, you're not, because you're never going to be 28 or 38 or 48 or 58 again, but you are going to be 68. Whoa, what, what do you mean? They, yeah, you can make mistakes when you're 68. What mistakes? Yeah, you don't know yet. You're not 68 yet. It's like, oh my gosh. And there you are, you know, because I got 28, 38, 48, 58 figured out, but I'm, I'm heading towards 68. It's like, what's going to happen? Uh, yeah. Going to be one run through those quadrants. Your initiation continues. All right. With that word of encouragement, I'll pray. And uh, <laughs> if you come back, you know, God have mercy on your souls. Anyway, no. I, but I do think, I think those are important things to think about. Uh, without being negative. All right, here we go. Father, we do thank you again for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to look into these things. We do ask that we would take it serious, that we'd look at these quadrants and realize that we will be in those positions, but you are there with us just like they were in Psalm 107, that we can always call out to you, and that what you've called us to do will be successful no matter where we are at, that we can continue to follow you and work the will that you've called us to do uh, because of your grace, your sufficiency, and because that we are in Christ doing the things he's called us to. Again, we ask that we'd stay in, on track and not take our eye off of you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for your patience and your time.